Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Ard Kwarma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur. This is the last week of the course and incidentally this is the last lecture of this course as well. In this week I have been talking to you about certain miscellaneous topics in bilingualism and multilingualism. In the last three lectures we actually uh, looked at uh, bilingual uh, literacy uh, literacy acquisition through bilingualism and multilingualism. We talked about how people learn to read across different languages due to different writing systems. In the last lecture, we talked about the purpose and the overall beneficial uh, nature of bi or multilingual education. In this lecture, I'll take you slightly to a different direction and we'll talk about another very applied uh, aspect of bilingualism and, uh, and multilingualism and we'll try and ponder about whether uh, bilingualism and multilingualism or how bilingualism and multilingualism has sort of changed the landscape of, uh, you know, communication across the world. Now, one of the major applications of bilingualism and multilingualism, if you look around yourselves, is media and advertisement. You go on a drive, you are driving through any road across the, across the country, you will see that, uh, you know, billboards on both sides of the road are essentially bilingual or multilingual. If they, if, if they are not bilingual, sometimes they are actually writing... Uh, let's say uh, Hindi words in English script, English words in Hindi script. I'm sure this is pretty much the uh, case for, say, for example, other parts of the country as well. Not only that, it is also very, uh, you know, uh, similar uh, in, in, in ways it manifests across the world. So uh, bilingualism has become the norm for communication, at least mass communication, not only in India, but across the world. And one of the major paradigms of mass communication is media and advertisement. I was talking about billboard advertisement. You can look at shop names, you can look at brand names of products, or you can also look at the way people communicate on social media. You can look at how people write their comments on YouTube, how people write their post their uh, things on X, how do they, uh, you know, uh, publish their websites and so on and so forth. So, this is a very very interesting application of bilingualism and multilingualism that you tend to see if you look around the world if you look around uh, any kind of public platforms large platforms for uh, sending out messages uh, you know and trying to access a larger range of audience and remember in in today's time a larger range of audience does not really mean just your district or just your state or just your country or your continent it is basically we're trying to because in the era of globalization, uh, the entire world is an open market, so to speak, and everybody who's creating a product or providing a service wants to reach and wants to have uh, reach to the entire, uh, you know, uh, world and have access to the uh, largest uh, number of people possible. So, one of the driving and also this has been one of the driving. So, while I'm talking about how bilingualism has become the default way of uh, mass communication, it is the other way around as well. Bilingualism also drives mass communication in, in a particular way and mass communication, say needs for mass communication also, uh, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, force people to become bilingual and multilingual and uh, achieve and, uh, you know, uh, acquire the ability to learn and communicate in different languages at the same time. If you look at, uh, you know, the last few decades, especially, you will see that there has been an exponential rise uh, of the possibilities for language contact, which have been prompted by global advertising, internet communication and other forms of electronic media, say, for example, Facebook, X, YouTube, and so many others. Now, one of the most interesting forms of, uh, you know, electronic, communi uh, electronic communication has actually been global advertising, as I was saying, which offers the possibility of language in, uh, exchange and mixing, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, producing, sending out messages and consuming or comprehending the messages that are out there. People want to know what is happening in different parts of the world, as well as they also want themselves to be heard across the world, across different, uh, you know, parts of the world. Now, 
an interesting aspect of this uh, you know uh, global rise in bio or multilingualism has been that it has mainly centered around english now this is interesting in in a sense uh, but if you look at uh, it historically uh, the uh, the british actually conquered more than half the world uh, wherever they went they colonized people they uh, and they imparted their own culture their own, their own language and this is probably one of the main reasons why english has become a lingua franca across the world also most important uh, you know the most uh, powerful uh, both militarily and economically and politically uh, most uh, you know most powerful countries also sort of speak english or at least english is one of the major languages that they speak say for example while uh, uh, in most of uh, while north america britain uh, australia etc speak english majorly other countries of the world such as china or countries of europe as well as india also plays a lot of importance on english so english in that sense has become a major lingua franca which uh, has uh, you know uh, uh, basically uh, invited everybody uh, to learn and acquire english uh, because there are so many advantages to it now uh, this is interesting because if 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 i am saying that you have to learn english you are also not leaving behind your native languages so the phenomena uh, that you see across the world is uh, that of plurilingualism which basically see uh, has been harvested or uh, you know utilized in all forms of electronic communication but most importantly in advertising as well now a very interesting aspect of this plurilingualism is that across the world advertisers consciously or unconsciously have favored plurilingualism because they want to increase or uh, enhance their reach to the larger sections of the society again society uh, does not mean just uh, restricted sections but we are talking about the entire world also advertising is become a very integral part of modern day communication especially in uh, electronic media because that is what basically drives everything all the content that you create uh, that you see created on instagram youtube so on and so forth basically is monetized because the mo money is coming from advertisers and those advertisers because now content is consumed across the board across the world the advertisers have chosen a lingua franca english that they want to push and pedal in and therefore you will see that across the world whatever content you are consuming there are english advertisements uh, you know interspersed uh, across the whole length of a video or or a movie and so on now there are some key issues that we can discuss about uh, you know this trend of global and international advertising as you know globalization can be defined as an integration or an integrative outcome of the interaction between uh, finance markets technologies and information systems in such a way that it's bringing the world together the idea is and uh, sometime back the prime minister narendra modi also said that information is going to be the currency of the next uh, you know century because it is information that everybody wants to both consume and propagate and it is this uh, you know propagation of information uh, that is what is bringing people together and everybody wants to do it in a faster way in a cheaper way and more effectively trying to reach the largest sections possible a very interesting concern in this has been this paradox of communicating in a manner that is effective and appealing at both the global level as well as the local or regional level so for example if you look around you will see that there are ads that uh, obviously uh, you know uh, are there in your regional language say for example i am i'm living in north india in iit kanpur so obviously a bunch of ads that i consume are in the uh, language of the region which is hindi but they are generously interspersed with english as well uh, in in a sense that it sort of also appeals to a larger and global audience. audience this is a very interesting paradox basically because at the same time advertisers want to reach both the global audience as well as the local audience with the information that they want to sort of uh, put out and 
it is it is very interesting if you sort of uh, you know are conscious and looking around and observing say for example you might have noticed how international brands uh, adapt their uh, advertisement pitches their taglines their slogans uh, even their product portfolios across different countries say for example when mcdonald's came to india they started with the mcdonald's alu tikki burger which is obviously not what they sell in europe because they there they sell cheeseburgers which are you know cheeseburgers and hamburgers and so on and so forth Uh, similarly you have a uh, uh, dosa kind of wrap as well you have a dosa kind of burger as well you have a mac spicy paneer wrap and basically you see that mcdonald's and not only mcdonald's there are so many other brands you know uh, the way we consume cold drinks uh, i mean they taste different in different countries and it is because manufacturers address adjust the sugar content uh, nutritional content according to the local uh, preferences as well as local uh, rules and regulations now another interesting choice that confirms advertisers has been the choice of language obviously if you look at it and i've been talking about this uh, you know in a particular uh, manner so far that if you look if you cursorily only look at the ads of global brands it would reveal that english is the default choice for global advertisers and marketers it has become one of the most used languages and has dethroned its competitors such as french and russian and thus become the single most important language in this era of globalization and interestingly as advertisers uh, you know uh, need to solve this customization problem or this paradox between global and local uh, regional levels of reach uh, while an initial intuition would suggest that you know supremacy of monolingual text should be there in advertising barty and richie actually suggest that advertisers have tried to solve this paradox by adopting an approach grounded in the prevalent plurilingualism so again it is uh, english and another uh, regional language of choice that people are uh, majorly following now this solution is important because it creates a communicative accommodation which is an important ingredient allowing advertisers to gain maximum appeal for their products and uh, also creating favorable effective consequences so this is precisely the problem that i'm sort of bringing to you and i'll basically present a few examples here and there to uh, basically help you appreciate how bilingualism or multilingualism uh, you know has impacted and has probably got impacted by uh, economic uh, political social uh, socio cultural phenomena uh, i'm taking just one case which is the case of advertising but if you try and extrapolate it to several other kinds of happenings you'll find that uh, you know that that uh, these things are also uh, uh, propelling bilingualism and are getting supported by this culture of by and multilingualism as well now uh this whole paradigm of advertisement the language of advertisement for example ha- can be studied through a variety of approaches there are linguistic approaches to look at them there are literary approaches to look at them there are also semiotic approaches to lo- look at them uh, which basically talk about how uh, certain uh, layers of meanings are being uh, you know uh, propagated across across the larger sections of society uh focusing on linguistic approaches within linguistic approaches you can also see there are three or four different kinds of things there there's a linguistic approach there are semantic approaches pragmatic approaches and then psycholinguistic and other information processing approaches again this is just a bit of a typology that i wanted to uh, let you know about but let us go uh, uh, ahead and look in slightly more detail uh, about this plurilinguist sort of view of advertising Now the three very salient features of this plurilingual approach to advertising are as follows. First, advertising is essentially considered as a mixed system that involves both verbal and non-verbal components. So you see there are pictures, there is music, uh, uh, there are different kinds of uh, these uh, you know uh, sensory information as well as well as that there are uh, you know verbal components. and these uh, media components and textual components they sort of exhibit a complex pattern of information sharing which you can see that forms a sort of a continuum on one end there are ads in which there is a lot of text and on the other end there is a there are ads that are that, that have a lot of multimedia content so you can basically see that it is a, a perfect balance of multimedia and text that uh, you know uh, advertisers have wanted to create uh, in order uh, you know for them to be able to create the maximum impact the maximum appeal the maximum reach for their products 
another the verbal component of an ad for example mirrors two very critical complementary aspects of this bilingual multilingual social behavior for example uh, there there are efforts to keep two linguistic se systems separate so for example you will typically see uh, you know uh, older bilingual ads would have uh, a whole sense a uh, whole page in hindi and then you turn the page and you will have the whole page in english so i'm talking about pamphlets that are very uh, common uh, in the previous decade uh, there is also an interesting thing that uh, some of more creative advertisers and marketers have actually looked at mixing the and integrating the two linguistic systems. Say, for example, if you uh, look at the ad of Pepsi, uh, it is very interesting that they come up with a tagline which says "Ye Dil Mange More," where you will see that uh, first is the the entire brand, the brand name, product name, etc., is in English, but the tagline is half Hindi or let's say seventy-five percent Hindi, and there's an English word just to add an effect, just to add that creative. Uh, buzz to it. Now, while language mixing has therefore become an integral aspect of multilingual verbal behavior, plurilinguals somehow are regarded as having trouble in expressing their thoughts and their language usage is somehow considered slightly impoverished because what happens is if you uh, move ahead uh, or if you move away from expressing yourself in a one in a single language, uh, you sort of start running out of uh, the best ways to put your thoughts in and therefore a mixed approach sometimes is actually judged as lacking uh, you know uh, grammar lacking the uh, overall sense and so on and this is typically what is uh, uh, you know uh, mirrored in the negative view of uh, advertisement say for example uh, bilinguals mixed verbal behavior has sometimes been referred to as uh, you know according to this negative view as deficient in uh, you know in in quality in deficient in semantic semantic content as well as uh, uh, syntactic correctness and so on it is often seen and uh, at least in earlier days if you're mixing languages and speaking and by the way uh, now also you will uh, you know you'll find a lot of people are purists they will tell you that okay if you're speaking in english only speak in english if you're speaking in hindi only speak in hindi and they will have all sorts of arguments in support of that and it's interesting, for example, Gumpers and others have pointed out that bilinguals, when they are mixing, they actually become rather conscious of their language mixing. And if you point that out to them, Ke, are, why are you speaking in both of these languages? Uh, and you can see that I mixed here, they would become slightly apologetic about it and which is in, in some sense very interesting. Now, there is obviously a neutral view to this as well. For example, uh, according to this neutral view, language mixing only accomplishes basically this low level cosmetic effects. You know, it, it grabs attention. When you see, uh, you know, Pepsi's tagline that ye dil mange more and there, there are so many ads with so many of these uh, jingles and taglines, you will see that they basically work best in grabbing initial attention, but they don't really, uh, you know, engage people for the longest time. They, they are some, sometimes seen as a transient fad or a rather short-lived charm all right and therefore the evidence for this view sort of lies in the fact that advertisers only occasionally use foreign language materials just to grab the attention but later the they sort of uh, uh, you know shift to uh, mainly monolingual messaging monolingual text and so on there is also a very positive view of this. So a positive view of this is basically, uh, 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 you know, which looks at language mixing as a very systematic and rule governed phenomena, which basically, which is used to satisfy the creative needs of bilinguals uh, or bilingual creators of these advertisements and so on, especially which can neither be met effectively from either of the two linguistic systems. Say, for example, if you wanted to create a, you know, a, a, a uh, head turning effect if you want people to catch uh, catch up on that jingle uh, it is interesting because uh, if you see if you say ye dil mange more and there's a violation of language uh, it suddenly grabs attention and uh, somehow i'm at a loss of remembering uh, so many of these examples but you will see that there is a lot of this and it uh, not only provides creative expression to the ad creators and jingle creators and so on it also uh, achieves that effect of this uh, you know uh, grabbing this attention and uh, uh, you know getting people engaged with your project uh, products in the first place 
So this view recognizes the fact that uh, language mixing in advertising can satisfy the deeper innovative and creative needs of advertisement writers uh, and it also helps create the desired effects of persuasiveness, uh, naturalness and other psychological effects that work in the advertisement industry. Now, now we've seen the different views that are uh, there that exist for language mixing in the advertisement space. Now in the next few slides, I'll look at, I'll show you some examples of how this global spread of um, plurilingual advertisement is happening. And again, as I said, English has been the epicenter of this. Now, interestingly, if you see English has or is the epicenter of these plurilingual, uh, pl plurilingual approaches to advertising and marketing. For instance, it has and there are there are solid reasons for that. Uh, for example, English has official status in at least, uh, you know, 75 countries with a population of over 2 billion individuals. Moreover, it is spoken as a first or a second language along with one or more other languages by around 750 million people in uh, 750 million people. Around 800 million people are believed to be speaking uh, English as a foreign language. So you can see the reach that English offers you or English advertisements offer you are obviously incomparable to any other language in the world. Uh, interestingly, according to the British Council, English is not only the choice language for books, newspapers, airports, uh, air traffic control, international businesses, law, most academic conferences, science uh, articles, uh, technology uh, uh, articles, diplomacy, sport, international competition, you can uh, name a particular area and you will see that English is rather prevalent in those areas. Now moving on, there has been a lot of research about this global spread of English speaking communities and it has led to some sort of uh, you know development of typologies and models based on users and the users of language. One very interesting typology was uh, put forward by Kachru in 1985 and then updated in 2005 which basically talks about three concentric circles uh, and these concentric circles are basically categorized as the inner circle, outer circle and the expanding circle which basically represent the, those countries uh, that were initially speaking uh, English as a native language and those countries where English exists in its non-native context which is your outer circle uh, and also uh, you know finally those countries who recognize the importance of uh, English as uh, international uh, you know lingua franca I mean you can see here uh, you see that inner circle basically contains countries like USA and UK uh, outer circle is probably colonies of these kind of uh, colonies of Britain in, in that sense but there is obviously an expanding circle you know for example in countries like like China, Japan and so many other countries that are increasingly day by day recognizing the importance of communicating in English. Uh, they are making considerable changes in their uh, you know, educational systems, uh, their systems of communication with the outside world as well as their uh, you know, language of the economy, the language in which businesses are conducted for that matter. Now I just present a bit of a uh, you know, demonstration for you. Uh, basically uh, uh, looking at how uh, English is being used uh, very interestingly in advertisement uh, especially through non-Roman scripts. So you see when English advertisements are found in Roman scripts um, you know mainly across Europe because uh, most of the European languages use the Roman script they do not really cause that much uh, attention attention grabbing that much turning of heads uh, or probably not to us uh, but if uh, English uh, advertisements are brought in and made part of uh, you know non-Roman scripts that is certainly a head turner so let's let's look at uh, you know a, a couple of these uh, demonstrations look at this ad this is the ad of uh, you know uh, uh, Shandar Shakti uh, Apna LML Vespa T, uh, T5 ES ka aerodynamic andas iski seat ko banaya gaya hai khas aapke liye uh, steering handle ka design aisa ki aap jitna bhi chalaye thakan mehsoos hi na ho uh, 8 bhp ki shakti jo uh, jag uthe sirf button dabate hi bemisal raftar ke liye uh, Kushal engineering se bana suspension you say you lage ki aap ho hawa par now if you see it's it's a very interesting ad of uh, LML Vespa is a very old ad LML Vespa is probably uh, something that used to be around in the uh, you know 90s and probably early 2000s uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly but you will see this is a very interesting ad which is by the way written in Hindi uh, 
predominantly using the Devanagari script used to denote Hindi. Uh, but interestingly, you will see that the critical aspects, because they cannot be translated uh, from English, they have been denoted just like that in uh, the Devanagari script. In, in some sense, you know, you see there's a lot of romanization of the Indian languages. Here you can see that there is a Devanagarization of English, which is basically uh, trying to pedal a uh, English major ad to the Hindi speaking, Hindi reading uh, audience. Another example of the same kind is this uh, Korean ad and I'm, sh uh, and I'm uh, sorry that I cannot read Korean but you can see that there are critical aspects which are presented in English. Say for example this thing like coloring, uh, the AGM, uh, there are other aspects also so in uh, molding, color designing, AGC uh, and uh, then there is this branding of uh, Samsung company here. You can see this is a Korean ad. Uh, majorly it is in Korean. Obviously the uh, the script that is used is Hangul which is used to write Korean. But this is also a very interesting ad which has both elements of English and uh, Korean in that. And in that sense it sort of uh, allows the advertiser to reach a much wider audience. Let us look at these ads in a little bit more detail now that I have shown you them. So, while the Hindi advert from the outer India circle, uh, outer circle India, uh, you know, capitalizes on the relatively high incidence of bilingualism, uh, you know, in, in India with English, it does not make any attempt to reinforce English either by means of paraphrasing anything in terms of English or writing them in the Roman script. The creators of the ad actually assume that their readers will be bilingual, so they will be able to understand English and Hindi at the same time. Uh, and also, if they're not bilingual, uh, these people are pushing them to sort of read English words because they are written in the Devanagari script. Because uh, uh, reading from the Devanagari script is very transparent, very smooth, it's a phonologically transparent language as we've discussed in the previous lectures, you might not need to put any other effort to read an English word which is written in the Devanagari script because it is very easy to read. Also, if you look at this Hindi uh, advert, you will see that the only explicit sign for the presence of English in the Hindi in, in Hindi is the model number of that thing T5EAS if you remember, which is actually the only part that is mentioned in the Roman script. Okay. Uh, interestingly, the ad seems completely monolingual because it's totally written in the Devanagari script used to uh, uh, write Hindi. Uh, it employs the, it basically uh, employs the attention getter uh, in Hindi. Say for example, monolingual text uh, called Shandar Shakti, which is, you know, written in Hindi. But if you look at it more closely, you will learn that the body of the advertisement includes uh, Hindi interwoven with the uh, English uh, and which is uh, italicized and written in the Devanagari script. So you're just drawing attention. It's drawing attention to the mix of languages. It is drawing attention. It, the, it's, it's first um, uh, appealing to the local audience by uh, putting everything out in Hindi, writing in Devanagari script. But, uh, uh, yeah, you know, in, in that sense, it is also appealing to the bilingual audience by, uh, you know, once they start reading, if they uh, know how to read uh, Hindi, they will also get, uh, you know, the details in English which could not be translated to Hindi. In contrast, if you look at the Korean ad, it does not expect the same degree of bilingualism amongst its uh, consumers or on part of its readers and the ad is built primarily on a paraphrasing strategy. Okay, the readers are initiated into bilingualism by the inclusion of uh, uh, inclusion in the ad of both uh, kinds of scripts. So you have, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, something written in Korean Hangul, and bottom of that you will find some the same thing written paraphrased in English. Uh, also, the Korean ad exhibits the use of English in a more elaborate way. Okay, uh, it's it's in the critical areas of the advertisement. Uh, although the ad creators have used English expressions in the Roman script, say for example, in the acronym AGC, in molding color design and the whole word of coloring where color and R is here and then ING is there, the overall ad actually contains much more text in Korean depicted in the Hangul script than in English. The attention getter, however, the word, the expression coloring is obviously English, which basically, uh, you know, makes for a much wider appeal of the advertisement. Now, if you look at it, 
both these ads uh, therefore reveal a very interesting strategy on the part of the ad creators which reveals generous use of english as the key attention getter uh, for these ads not only in roman but also in the script of the native language which seems almost you know it seems very surreptitious that you write english word in hangul or english word in devanagari and you expect that people are not sort of people just buy into this and they will sort of get uh, um, you know sucked in into reading this uh also uh, you know more importantly both ads demonstrate how the marketers and advertisers have solved this global versus regional paradox by including an international language in the mix although the ad is generously interspersed with key elements in the regional languages so you know the the shandar shakti ad is an actually hindi ad the korean uh, uh, coloring ad is actually a korean ad but it has a lot of english uh, basically making it appeal both the local and the uh, global uh, audience now multilingualism uh, basically so this is again uh, so slightly moving ahead uh, let's look at this construction of ads in in a, in a different setting as well say for example let's look at how these ads are structured so that we sort of understand this in some more detail now given the brief demonstration in the two ads uh, we just discussed let's look more closely at the structural aspects of how these advertisements are constructed So Bharti and Richie have characterized the construction of an ad in eight parts. Its product name it contains product name, company name or logo, labels, pricing, availability, slogans, main body, and headlines and subheaders. Again, it is important to note that various considerations would go in when you are constructing an ad and creating these parts. For example, pricing and availability are primarily contents-based things, and they don't uh, you know have much in terms of the structure of creating ad and so on. also not all the ads that you come across will have all these eight parts and even when they do uh, they are not mutually exclusive so you will see them uh, you know uh, it's will it will be difficult to uh, separate them out from each other uh, and they are always not constructed in the mutually exclusive manner now another very interesting uh, concern that happens is basically uh, the consideration of uh, you know how these ads are created in the medium that they are going to appear so for example if you are creating an ad for television you will create it differently if you are creating an ad for billboards it will be created differently if you are creating an ad for social media it will also appear differently so you will see nowadays every advertisement agency has several channels of communication and they actually tailor their advertisements to the specific communication channel so an ad on instagram versus uh, x would actually look very different from an ad on Uh, facebook or an ad on youtube which will allow you more space similarly an ad on a billboard versus an ad on television will also be very very different differently constructed so just by way of demonstration let me show you another ad which has been combined by uh, bharti and richie you'll see this is an ad for uh, tirupati spices uh, probably sometime uh, you know long back which has been uh, you know uh, Put together, and you see it's very interesting. Jale par namak zarur chhedakiye, and then you have all of this text in Hindi. So swadesh tuwa uh, lazadar uh, mahakta hua khana har roz banaye khane ki mahak uh, parosan tak pochne bijiye. Uh, Vah jale to jale. So again, you have a lot of messaging in Hindi. But interestingly, if you see, you know, everything is in Hindi here in these parts. But if you look at the packaging, the packaging actually has all of these details in English. So you can see again how advertisers are cleverly using both Hindi and English text together in the same advertisement to still, you know, while they mainly want to appeal the local audience, they also have an eye out for in their packaging for the global, uh, you know, uh, markets for the global uh, consumers. All right, again, this is something that I've already uh, mentioned. now so this ad uses a very and if you look at this ad it uses a very interesting rule violating strategy to grab attention of the consumers for instance common sense would dictate that one does not rub salt on wound you know jale par namak chhedakiye obviously you don't rub uh, salt on if you have a wound or if you have a burn but th this is been used as an attention getter in the ad you know as soon as you listen to somebody saying jale par namak chhedakiye or you know add uh, uh, salt to your burns or wounds you will uh, you know you will automatically your attention is that we want to see oh why is this person saying something like that so 
it basically violates traditional wisdom and basically uh, you know uh, uh, draws attention to the quality of their product and then you can see in that uh, hindi paraphrasing they've actually explained that if you make so flavorful and so tasty food uh, it will uh, you know the the aroma of the food will reach your neighbors and they'll become jealous and this is a good thing and so on and so forth okay so interestingly if you look at this ad it also reflects the changing societal values uh, you know uh, in in uh, the indian society given that making one's neighbor jealous would be considered counter to indian values traditionally uh, because neighbors are typically considered to be part of our extended families now also note that the ad is primarily in hindi and the body of the text is majorly written in hindi using the devanagari script the critical aspects on the display packaging as i was mentioning was created in english uh, also interestingly you see there is a minor tagline so there is a jale par namak chidake tagline in the hindi ad but there is also a minor tagline on the packaging which says the great taste of marwar uh, which is written in english and in the roman script so that uh, you know it is uh, able to reach a wider range of consumers so this is again a demonstration of how bilingualism and multilingualism has been utilized by uh, advertisers and marketers and how they have sort of used this whole balance of plurilingualism uh, balance of uh, you know communicating to global as well as local audience at the same time i hope you enjoyed this course i hope you enjoyed this lecture and uh, this is uh, from my side the end of this course and i hope uh, by the time you finish all of these 39 lectures you will have learned a lot about bilingualism and multilingualism and it would help you in various ways thank you so much goodbye